carry on looking at Isaiah 61. Um, Dan shared last week, really brilliantly, on uh, the first three verses, um, and we were looking at how God's kingdom is over every kingdom, and we're going to continue looking at that today. Um, So I just wanted to do a really brief um, overview of of Isaiah, really quick, (laughs) all 66 chapters, no, but um, just to give a bit of background. So Isaiah was a prophet writing in the 8th century BC, so 800 years before Jesus was born. Um, And it spans the reign of four kings of Israel and Judah, starting with Isaiah. Um, and he was writing, as I was writing, to the people of God. And there's like some broad themes. Um, the, it starts with Isaiah accusing the people of their sin and their rebellion against the one who had created them and called them. It then moves on to Isaiah um, instructing the sinners to repent and turn back to God and to obey him. Um, And then he brings judgment on the people of God and on the surrounding nations as well because of their sin. But all through, there are little drips of hope that come through Isaiah, um, ending up in the last few chapters um, when he reveals the future restoration and the hope of salvation um, throughout the book. Um, We've been watching the Marvel films Um, And I didn't think I'd enjoy them, but I've been hooked, really liked them. And at the end, after the credits, there's a little teaser of what's to come later. And it's like that in Isaiah, that all through the the kind of doom and gloom a little bit, there are little nuggets of the hope that is going to come. And so really briefly, can you put that? Yeah, there's the first slide. So chapters 1 to 12 are based on God's relationship with his people. Then moving on, it's God's relationship with the nations. And then we look at how God's grace is on his people and he is yearning for them to come back to him. Um, And then we see God's servant, who we know is Jesus, who is the, um, the way for them to come back to him. And then the last chapters, which is where we're at today, is looking at God's kingdom um, and how um, through Jesus um, he establishes the new kingdom and it's through that kingdom that God's people are blessed but the surrounding nations are blessed as well. So that's where we're at. Um, Isaiah in two minutes. Um, so we're in this fifth part. So let's, let's turn to Isaiah 61 verse 4. We're looking at 4 to 6 today. Uh, But we'll just look at verse 4. Thank you. Um, So verse 4 says, They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the former devastations. They will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And who are we talking about? We're talking about the people that Dan was looking at last week. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. So Isaiah is saying here, those people that were captives, those people that were in bondage, those people who were poor in spirit, they are the ones who are going to build, rebuild the ancient ruins. They're going to restore the former devastations they will renew the ruined cities and I don't know about you but straight away I thought about Nehemiah when I read these because God you may not know the story of Nehemiah if not read it we're going to look at it a little bit later but God called Nehemiah who was an Israelite to rebuild the city at the walls of Jerusalem and also Ezra which is the chapter before he called Ezra to um, rebuild the temple, which was lying in, in a state of, of ruin. And although these books, Nehemiah and Ezra, the Bible's a bit confusing sometimes because Nehemiah and Ezra are quite a bit earlier on in the Bible. They actually happened way after Isaiah. 
So when, when Isaiah is talking about this, he's talking, he's prophesying what was going to happen several hundred years later. And we're going to, as I say, we're going to look at Nehemiah a little bit in, the, in a minute. Um, but what we're looking at in those books is, is it tells of God's people returning to Jerusalem after they'd been exiled, which was again after Isaiah. Um, and Isaiah was prophesying about the Jerusalem being rebuilt. And we'll look at that soon. But we can also just repl- um, apply these verses to our own lives. If we know Jesus, if we've been saved, we've, we were ruins and we've been rebuilt. We've been singing this morning about how we've been set free. We were in captivity, but now we're free. And so... Whereas Isaiah is talking about those Israelites who were, who were in captivity and now set free, he's also talking about us. We were slaves, but now we're free. I read this quote by a man called Matthew Henry, who you might have heard of, amazing commentator. And he said this about this verse. An unsanctified soul is like a city that is broken down. And has no walls, like a house in ruins. But by the power of Christ's gospel and grace, it is repaired. It is put in order again and fitted to be the habitation of God through the Spirit. How can I read it again? Because it just makes me cry. An unsanctified soul is like a city that is broken down and has no walls, like a house in ruins. That was us. But by the power of Christ's gospel and grace, it is repaired. It is put in order again and fitted to be a habitation of God through the Spirit. That's what's happened to us. But not only that, as those who have been rebuilt, as those who have been restored, we are called to go to those who are still in a state of brokenness. We, as we've been looking at for weeks now, we are called to go. We're surrounded by people who are broken. We're surrounded by people whose walls are in a state of disrepair. And it might be obvious, it might not be obvious, they might look like they've got it all together. But if they don't know Jesus, they are broken. And it's up to us to go and share the good news of of Christ to them. Um, And it goes on at the end of verse 4, it says, um, they will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And as I was reading that, I just felt God wanted to speak to those that maybe um, have been in families where there's just a cycle of, um, of ruin and of despair and of hopelessness. And just felt God wanted to say, no one is beyond me. No one is beyond my salvation. It doesn't matter how many generations there's been of that cycle. Um, God is able to do a new thing. He can break through into cycles of, of despair and rebellion and hopelessness. And for us too, you know, let's not look at people and discount them. God is able to do a new thing in their lives. And, and for those of you who are, you know, have been in um, homes and been brought up in homes that don't know the Lord and for generations haven't known the Lord, God has done a new thing in you and he has broken that cycle and your children that come after you are a testament of that and are going to live in that. So he can renew the cities, the devastations of many generations. Amen. So let's go on, verse 5. Strangers will stand and feed your flocks, and foreigners will be your plowmen and your vine dressers. There we are. So here Isaiah is saying that whereas the foreigners in, in the, well, not in the past, in what's going to happen in the next hundred years or so, foreigners are going to oppress the Israelites, they're going to make them slaves, they're going to be victims of the foreigners. He's now saying there will be a time coming when they will be your servants and they will serve you. There's going to be a flip round. 
Um, so, yeah, whereas there have been times and will be times when the people of God will be exploited, the future will see those foreigners serving them. And the title of this series is God's Kingdom Over Everything, the Kingdom Over Everything. And we have to remember time and time again, I have to remind ourselves, God's kingdom is over everything, everything. He is over and above every earthly kingdom, power and authority. He is. That's where he is. There's no question. He is over everything. And he can and he has and he will use others, perhaps outside the kingdom, to accomplish his purposes. That's what he does. He's able to do that. They might not even be aware of it. They're almost like chess pieces that God can use others. He can use his church. He can use his people. But he can use others outside his kingdom for our good and for his kingdom purposes. Matthew Henry again says, when our hands are employed, but our hearts not engaged by the affairs of the world, but reserved entirely for God and his service, then foreigners serve us. So in other words, he's saying, if you seek, Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, put God first in your life, And then all these things will be added to you. Um, And other people will serve your purposes, which are the kingdom's purposes. Um, So we need to learn how to be in the world, how to be useful to the world, how to serve people in the world, but to hold God and his kingdom as the priority in our hearts. And when we do that, and we'll look at some examples in a moment from the scripture, but when we do that, we will know and see God working in our lives, but also in the lives of those around us for his kingdom. God is in control of everything. Yes, yes, God is in control of everything. The orbit of the earth around the sun, the orbit of the moon around the earth, um, Global events, earthly rulers, down to the behaviour of atoms and molecules, God is over everything. We exist, the world exists because God sustains it. We need to remember that. I'm breathing here, I'm standing here because God is, is sustaining me. That's why I'm here. And he is over everything. He is sovereign. Amen. And we need to remember that there is a big picture that we might not see, but God knows and God sees. So we're going to look at a couple of characters from the Bible that demonstrate how God uses men, uh, his people in foreign environments to see his kingdom advanced. But also how because of that, because those people stand up for God, and, and remain true to God in those situations, he, he uses um, others that don't know him to accomplish his purposes as well. So let's have a look. So we're going to look at Nehemiah again. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Nehemiah 1, 1 to 4. I'll just turn there now. So Nehemiah was uh, an Israelite, and this is happening in the time um, of the exile. So most of the Israelites had been exiled, um, but news comes from the remnant that are in Jerusalem. So let's have a look. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. During the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanani, One of my brothers arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. They said to me, the remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall has been broken down, and its gates have been burned." When I, this is Nehemiah now, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. 
I mourned for a number of days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great, and then it goes on. I won't read all of the prayer, but he is, Nehemiah is broken hearted because of what's going on in his hometown. It's a really, really bad situation. And he kneels before God and he prays. And God responds to Nehemiah's, Nehemiah's heart. He responds to his courage and his boldness because Nehemiah then decides to go and see the king. So let me just read in verse chapter 2, verses 1 and 6. After Nehemiah has prayed, this is what he does. During the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I'd never been sad in his presence, so the king said to me, Why are you sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, May the king live forever. Why should I be, not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, What is your request? So I prayed to the God of heavens and I answered the king. He was scared. This was scary because the king could have done anything to him. But he says this, If it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I may rebuild it. The king, with the queen seated beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take and, what will you, and when will you return? So I gave him a definite time and it pleased the king to send me. So wow, God is moving because God responded to Nehemiah's prayer. He responded to his courage and his boldness. He responded to the fact that God's ways were Nehemiah's priority. His priority was what was going on in Jerusalem. His priority was seeing God establishing his kingdom. So God responded by softening the heart of the king and enabled Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem and oversee the rebuilding of the walls. That king could have said no and then... Who knows what would have happened. But because of Nehemiah's integrity and boldness and purity, he stepped out and God rewarded that by changing the heart of the person who was in authority over him. Another character I just want us to quickly look at is Daniel. We've been looking at Daniel woo, in our Bible study and um, it's really good. And I, I know a lot, of, uh, we've all heard of Daniel in the lion's den, but... Um, there is so much in the book of Daniel, and I would encourage you to read it. We're on to the tricky part now, the second part, but still good. Um, and we're, we're getting so much out of it. But So when I read this uh, passage in Isaiah, it just straight away I thought of, of Daniel and how Daniel used uh, the king at that time to serve the purposes of Daniel, which were God's purposes. Um, so, in the time of Daniel, Israel was, Israel was in exile in Babylonia. So this is kind of in the middle, where after Isaiah, about 100 years or so after Isaiah, we haven't got to Nehemiah yet, although Daniel is further on in the Bible. It's very confusing. But so Daniel, we're about in the middle. They've been exiled, um, and that's, it, it's, no, they haven't been exiled. They've been um, Yes, they have been exiled to Babylonia. I'm getting confused. They've been exiled to Babylonia. And um, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of that time. Now, Babylonia in that time, we were learning, was the most um, influential and powerful kingdom of that time. King Nebuchadnezzar was the top dog. He was, they were like here. Um, and Israel had been captured by the Babylonians, and they were in exile there. Um, and it was about as bad as it gets for the people of God. Nebuchadnezzar had laid siege to Jerusalem. Most of the people had been exiled, and things weren't going well. They were strangers in a foreign land. And all the promises of God that they had got in, their, in the scripture must have seemed a long way off. But God was still on the throne. 
he is still on the throne and he is still in that really bad situation. He is still working his purposes out, even in a hopeless situation. He wants to bless Babylon because his people are there and he wants to bless his people. So enter Daniel. He was a man of integrity, faithfulness and boldness. He was at home in Babylon. So he was at college there. He was learning the ways of the nation. He was immersing himself in that culture. He wasn't standing off saying, oh, I don't want anything to do with you. He was in the culture. He was, um, yeah, immersed himself in it. But he didn't separate himself, but he stayed pure. He's made God his priority. Um, and that's tough, as we've seen just now. It's hard to be in the world but not of it sometimes, but Daniel nailed it. He did it really well. And because of that, God honoured him. He gave him divine wisdom and he was able to interpret the king's dreams. So Nebuchadnezzar, as you know the story, he had some weird and wonderful dreams that nobody could um, interpret. But Daniel was given the ability to interpret it. And because of that, um, he was honoured. Let's just have a look. We'll just quickly turn to Daniel 2, uh, 46 to 48. So Daniel has brought the, the interpretation, and this is Nebuchadnezzar's response. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell face down and worshipped Daniel and gave orders to present an offering and incense to him. So he hadn't quite got it, but anyway. The king said to Daniel, Your God is indeed God of gods, Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, since you were able to reveal this mystery. So what happened? The king promoted Daniel and gave him many generous gifts. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and chief governor over all the wise men of Babylon. So here's an Israelite, here's an exile being promoted to kind of second in command to the king himself. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to manage the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So because of Daniel's faithfulness, faithfulness, because of his integrity, because of his ability to be influential to those around him, but maintain his purity of heart, God honoured that. And we can think of other examples. I can think of Joseph. You know, Joseph was um, uh, promoted because he refused to compromise. Um, others in the Bible as well. Um, who experienced uh, favour from those in authority because of that um, commitment to God, first and foremost. Um, their, their recognition, these people, their recognition for him as sovereign God, whose kingdom is above every other kingdom, sees them favoured by the non-believers who have influence around them. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's... It's true of the church as well. Um, as we serve our communities, you know, as we're in the world, being useful to the world, but remaining faithful to God and his kingdom, we'll see favour from those in authority. You know, we've seen it. We've seen it with venture and the favour that they get um, because they are serving the community, but staying true to the reason that they're serving. Um, but I just want to add quickly, it's not always roses. You know, we can look at Nehemiah when he was rebuilding the walls. He had, if you read the story when you get home, huge opposition came his way. Um, and we know what happened to Daniel. He ended up in a, a den of lions. Um, so not always a, a bed of roses. But even in, in, the, um, in the adversity, God still worked his purposes out. Because his kingdom is over and above every kingdom. Other rulers, powers and authorities will come and go. But God's kingdom is established forever. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar was full of pride. And uh, I mean we've been reading um, Daniel as I said. And just 
kept thinking about the rulers of this world now and just thinking the pride, you know, we think of Putin and um, just the parallels. We're like, oh, Lord, humble Putin, like you've humbled Nebuchadnezzar, you know. Um, and, and the celebrities, you know, particularly comedians, it gets me so cross that they, they find it funny to put down God and put down the people of God um, and mock the people of God quite blatantly. They would not do it to other religions, but they do it to Christians. Um, but we read throughout scripture that God humbles the proud. And he did that with Nebuchadnezzar. Um, you can read in Daniel chapter 4, the drastic hum humiliation or humbling that he went through um, for, for years. Um, and and that, because, that was because he failed to acknowledge that he was in his position of authority because God had put him there, not because of his own authority. Um, and let's just turn just a little bit further on Daniel chapter 4 34 to 37 this is Neb uh, Nebuchadnezzar's response after that period of being humbled here we are Daniel here we go but at the end of those days so that's after this period of being I mean he, he grew feathers and hair and claws and lost his mind. It wasn't good. But at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honoured and glorified him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. This is Nebuchadnezzar who had thrown Daniel's friends into a burning, fiery furnace He's now saying this, his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing and he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my sanity returned to me and my majesty and splendor returned to me and the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out and I was re-established over my kingdom and even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt and glorify the king of heavens because all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. Wow, what a transformation of a, a man who did not acknowledge God at all is acknowledging and the fact that his kingdom is over, every, over everything. See, God doesn't just want to humble the proud for that end, to teach them a lesson. He wants to humble the proud so that they can confess what a glorious God he is. He wants um, to humble the proud so that they can acknowledge his kingdom above all others. So in Daniel and in Isaiah, we see that God intends to do more than merely judge those living in sin. He wants to bring salvation and redemption. And to do that, he needs a people, he needs us, he needs the church who are at home where he's put us. We're not removed from the world, we're in the world where God's put us, but we're revealing God's kingdom and kingship to those around us. You know, oh, that the church would faithfully pray and faithfully demonstrate the kingdom and we'd see proud leaders humbled and praise comes from their mouth. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be amazing? I know that's a lot to get from a little verse in Isaiah, but I just thought, you know, it's really good to remember that God is over everything and he's able to use anybody for his purposes. Um, and, and because if we're following God's purposes, it will be for our benefit. Okay, let's go on to verse 6. But you will be called the Lord's priests. They will speak of you as ministers of our God. 
You will eat the wealth of the nations and you will boast in their riches. Right. So let's have a look at that. So um, that kind of picture of us being priests, of God's people being priests. Back in Exodus, you don't need to look it up, but Exodus 19 verse 5, God speaks to Moses about the Israelites and he tells them that the Israelites are going to be a people belonging to him, a nation of priests. And then if we flip to 1 Peter 2 verse 5, I'll I'll read it if you don't need to turn to it. 1 Peter 2 verse 5. Actually, for verse 4, it says, As you come to him, that's Jesus, a living stone, rejected by people, but chosen and honoured by God, you yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood. There it is again, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And isn't it interesting there again, you yourselves, living stones, spiritual house, being built. We've got that picture there again of us being built into the people of God that we we saw earlier. Um, Living stones, so amazing. Um, And and then just going on to verse 9 in 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen race, that's us, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. That's us. That's us. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, that we might proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into the marvelous, into his marvelous light. We're called to be the people of God. Um, why? To proclaim his goodness so that we can demonstrate his kingdom and be ministers of his grace. God chose the Israelites. He chose the Jews to be his people. He wanted them to shine to the nations around, to demonstrate what it meant to be children of God. That was God's plan for them. That's what he wanted all along. And they messed up time and time and time again because they put what they wanted first before putting God first. And they just didn't learn that putting God first meant that they would be blessed and that they would be um, be that shining example of what it, it is to be belong to God. But praise God, through the grace of Jesus, we are now those chosen people. We're chosen to, we're called to reflect God and reflect him, to share who, how good he is to a watching world, to shine like stars. That's what we're called to do. Um, People around us need to know a saviour. And we're the ones that are called to do it, the holy priests, to call to minister God's goodness and his grace to those around us. Now, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's just coincidence the leaders chose this passage for now. Probably not. They probably prayed a lot about it. Um, But I was just thinking, oh, this is really good. Because when we see what's going on in the world stage around us, you know, just is tough, isn't it? We look at Ukraine and then ongoing problems in Afghanistan and, and all over the world. There, you know, it's just not good. Um, and COVID, you know, ongoing. Who thought two years later we'd still be in the situation we're in? And, you know, energy bills going up and thinking, oh, we better turn the fire off. We better not have that meal, better not go. You know, it's a struggle and people are struggling let alone our own personal struggles with health or um, finances or relationship problems or whatever. You know, but God is on the throne. He is still on the throne. He is ruling and reigning. And we need to remember that. You know, we watch the news and it can be really hard. And sometimes I've felt really low. I'm being honest. Think, God, what's happening? 
But he is on the throne. He is ruling and reigning. I just want us to think a minute. We've been talking about the kingdom of God. What, what is the kingdom of God? What does it mean? You know, it's not some kind of out there mysterious entity. The kingdom of God is anywhere where God is ruling and reigning. I know Dan spoke about that last week. He talked about when John the Baptist arrived on the scene and he said the kingdom of God is at hand because he knew Jesus was about to burst forth. And Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. He used parables to describe what the kingdom of God was like. Um, His ministry and his life demonstrated the kingdom of God. So when Jesus came, he brought with him the kingdom of God. But then Jesus taught us to pray, didn't he? Thy kingdom come. So we've got this kind of, uh, what's the word? Dilemma, paradox, where the kingdom is here, but it's yet to come. And um, I've heard this, uh, my brother-in-law talks about this a lot, um, that it, we're living in uh, already, but not yet. So the kingdom is here, but not yet fully here. Um, so to put it another way, uh, uh, um, one of the books I read was saying it's been inaugurated. In other words, it's been started, it's been introduced, it's here, but it's not yet consummated it's not completed so we're living in this tension of already not yet and I just think it's helpful if we think about the seasons um, and uh, I was thinking about this because it's March now well no it's April now it was March when I was writing it <laughs> it's April now but in March comes I think officially on the 21st of April uh, spring comes on the 21st of March I think um, and I think on the 21st of March, it was very spring-like. We had lovely weather. 28th of March, we had snow, I think it was. So, but it's still spring. It was snowing. It was really, really cold. Um, but it was still spring. Um, and I'm going to look at um, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Sarah's going, woo we're, um, we're big Narnia fans. Who here has read the Chronicles of Narnia? Yes. If you haven't, you need to read it, okay? Um, even, even if you just read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe this Easter, or watch the film, it's not as good as the book, but even watch the film, because it is just so full. I can't, I always cry every time. I, I read it to Elia couple of years ago and it's just like mummy why are you crying again because it's just it's just so full of amazing pictures of allegory of of what Jesus has done for us basically so read it if you haven't read it but um so uh, in the line the witch in the wardrobe um when the Pevensey children arrive on the scene Narnia is under the grip of the white witch it's always winter but never Christmas Can you imagine? Always winter, but never Christmas. I can't imagine it. Christmas is the reason for winter. And my birthday, and Ellie's birthday. But so there are good things. But anyway, so it's always winter, but never Christmas. For years and years and years, there has been no hope. No hope at all. But then, and I love this, there are rumours that start going around. And um, this little quote I'm going to read now, it doesn't matter if it doesn't come up. This little quote is um, Mr. Beaver speaking, and he's speaking to the, the children. And he says, they say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you, any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Love it, because Aslan was on the move. You know, when Daniel was in exile with the people of God, God must have felt very far away. It must have felt like it was winter, but never Christmas. Yet God 
was still at work. Aslan was on the move, or God was on the move. And for us now, you know, when things look out of control, God is in control. As we remain faithful in serving him, being obedient to him, we're ushering in that kingdom. We can see it at work in our lives every day. You know, in the nitty gritty, down to earth, getting up, going to work, going to college, going to school, babysitting, whatever you're doing, God is at work as we honour him. And it might not be spectacular, it might be, we might see amazing healings. That's the kingdom of God at work. But it might not be a major miracle. Every time I choose God's way and not my own way or the world's way, I'm demonstrating the kingdom here on earth because I'm demonstrating that God is ruling and reigning in my life. So I'm demonstrating the kingdom when I choose to honour my husband. Ashley. I'm, I'm demonstrating the kingdom when I discipline my child with kindness and grace and not anger and impatience. I'm, I'm demonstrating the kingdom when I choose not to gossip in the staff room. I'm demonstrating the kingdom when, I'm, when I forgive somebody who's really hurt me, intentionally or not intentionally, when I forgive them. I'm demonstrating the kingdom of God by giving when I see a need, even out of my lack. I'm demonstrating the kingdom of God when I honour and obey my parents. I'm demonstrating the kingdom of God by living a Christ-centred life and not a self-centred life. That's demonstrating the kingdom. That's ushering in the kingdom of God. Um, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly landing. Just going to look at my favourite scripture, Philippians 2, 13 to 16. I didn't put a little thing in this one. There we go. Philippians 2. So it it says, "For For God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure. Children of God, there we are, the kingdom of priests again. Children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. So for it, let me just read that again because it's so good. For it is God who is working in you to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure. Children of God, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, <clears throat> excuse me, among whom you shine like stars in the world, holding firm to the word of life. That's what it is to be living kingdom lives. Let's see others see the kingdom of God advancing in our own lives and in so doing, introduce them to that kingdom. Let's be repairers of broken walls, yeah? Let's see the kingdom of God first in our lives. Let's put God first in our lives and his kingdom in our lives. And in so doing, let's be useful to God, like uh, Nehemiah and Daniel and Joseph and all those others who put God first. God could use them. I want to be useful to God. I want to be used for his purposes. Let's declare the praises of the one who saved us to a watching world, reflecting God's justice, his love and his mercy. And let's remember, let's, if, there's, if you remember anything... Just remember, God's kingdom is higher, greater, and more powerful than any other kingdom. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and God is on the move. Aslan is on the move. 
even if it's winter, even if it's winter in what you're going through at the moment, he is on the move. Amen.